It is a privilege to introduce the annual Murray Friedman Memorial Lecture today, hosted in partnership with Advocacy Anywhere. Let me tell you a little bit about Murray. Murray Friedman was an American Jewish historian, a Jewish communal professional, a civil rights leader, scholar, mentor, writer, and founder and director of the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History at Temple University in Philadelphia. And for 43 years, he was the director of AJC Philadelphia Southern New Jersey. In speaking with leaders who are close to Murray, some mentioned his ability to take ideas and turn them into projects that changed people's lives. Some mentioned his numerous scholarly projects and how he was willing to explore new ideas and approaches and had intellectual courage. Murray worked hard to recruit and empower volunteers, especially younger members, and believed that they were at the heart of advancing the vital mission of American Jewish Committee. And now I'd like to turn the program back to Jason Isaacson. Thank you, Marcia. And please allow me to add my own affirmation of respect and affection for my late colleague, Murray Friedman, in whose honor I'm privileged to conduct today's conversation with Rabbi David Saperstein. David, and I must tell our audience that I grew up about four blocks from uh, David Saperstein uh, in Malvern, Long Island. Um, I've known him nearly my whole life, and it's uh, hard for me to call him by anything but his first name. David, thank you for once again addressing AJC. I'm going to pose a series of questions to you about global challenges to religious freedom and other topics in which you have unique expertise. And then we'll open up our conversation to questions from our viewers. So let's begin. Uh, David, I was listening last night to a radio program that you taped with our AJC Westchester director about three years ago. It was just before you were going to give a, a lecture uh, to an AJC audience in Larchmont, New York. Um, and, and you were relating the importance of America's voice in protecting religious freedom around the world. It was about 10 months after you had left your service as um, ambassador at large for international religious freedom. You spoke of the appreciation that persecuted communities had expressed to you for America's attention to their cause, which leads me to two questions. First, why is it America's responsibility to be the champion of religious freedom around the world? And second, why do you, as a rabbi, as a lawyer, as a community activist, as a public servant, why, why is it your responsibility to defend religious freedom? Indulge me for a minute just to join you. I'm sure. in Marsha, uh, who does such superb work for the region there. Um, in remembering Murray Friedman, um, uh, one of the blessings of my 50 years career is I got to work with the regional staffs of the American Jewish Committee, the ADL, the uh, my own Reform Jewish Movement, Conservative Movement, National Council of Jewish Women. You know, I've met immensely talented people, some doing pioneering work. Think of Sherry Frank's Black Jewish work in uh, in uh, Atlanta um, uh, and such respected people. But I think I can say safely. There is no person in that role that I had ever worked with who had the intellectual impact on the discourse in American Jewish life that Murray Friedman did. Um, we shared much in common. We differed. I was more liberal than uh, he was, but our commitment to social justice, our commitment to civil rights, our commitment um, to civil liberties, our commitment to the Jewish people, to the special relationship of Israel and the United States, the battle against anti-Semitism, and the rights of persecuted Jews um, across the globe kept us together. Fun debates that I cherished. There were few people I wanted to go up less against than uh, because of his intellectual <laughs> prowess. Um, uh, but what an extraordinary Extraordinary figure was. I'm so honored um, uh, to be doing this when, in this memorial lecture. Um, and this issue we're talking about is one he and I looked at it shared completely uh, together. Um, America has a responsibility uh, as a propagator of 
uh, democracy in general, a concept of human rights, a driving force in the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, um, a country founded by many people who are fleeing religious persecution. Um, it created a country that was based on the proposition that underlies all human rights on religious freedom ever since. The notion that one's rights as a citizen should never depend upon their religious identity, peaceful practices, their beliefs, their living out, their religious lives individually and in association with people who shared uh, their religions. And for Jews, for Jews, this was extraordinary. Never before in human history have we lived in a country that offered this. And as a result, particularly as the Supreme Court began to expand our, uh, the application of our fundamental rights, um, we Jews uh, enjoyed more freedoms, more rights, more opportunities in America than in any other country in the history of the Jewish people outside the land of Israel. This was an extraordinary nation for us. And we Jews who had been the quintessential victims of religious persecution, often the victims of physical attacks, quite more frequently uh, uh, living under restrictive um, laws and regulations that didn't allow us the freedoms that Christian or Muslim uh, um, uh, uh, contemporaries of those societies had. Um, we knew better than most what the price was when good people would stand idly by the persecution of any group culminating in the Holocaust um, uh, with such devastation to the Jewish people. So as an American and as a Jew, to have the opportunity on behalf of the United States of America to work with countries across the globe in common concern to help lift up um, uh, religious freedom is a fundamental right akin to all the other key human rights that human beings are entitled to and we hope will be enshrined in laws across the globe um, really was one of the greatest honors of, of my life. And I'm proud to say that I think uh, across different um, administrations, it is something in which America has made a positive impact. And there are millions and millions and millions of people across the globe um, uh, who live better because of the efforts of the American government and the American people um, uh, to help enshrine the ideal of religious freedom. Well, let's talk about that um, continuity from across administrations and across very different political um, ideologies, really. Um, you were succeeded by Senator Sam Brownback in the same interview that I referred to, I heard you talk about Senator Brownback, actually, who was then governor of Kansas, um, who had been, I guess, his name had been put forward. He hadn't yet uh, cleared the process. He wasn't yet going to be the ambassador. It was 10 or 11 months after you had left office. Um, a very different political orientation, Sam Brownback and yourself. You said that very clearly in the interview, and I know that. Um, how did his service differ from your service as ambassador at large? And what are you expecting? What are you hoping for in the Biden administration? Yeah. Um, Sam Brownback is about as far politically for me <laughs> as, uh, as uh, you can find. Um, uh, but we ended up being strange bedfellows in common battles uh, together. We put, I had been active in helping to forge a coalition um, at the beginning of the Bush administration, actually at the end of the Clinton administration, of a number of evangelical groups, many of whom I've been sharply critical and remain critical of many of their political agendas uh, in terms of women's rights, in terms of separation of uh, church and state, we were totally at odds at each other. Um, but I, it finally occurred to me, we'll do better trying to change folks uh, uh, by engaging them in common concerns where we can work together, get to know each other, trust each other, um, then we can't just do in combat with them. And so we reach out to them. We were working with the Catholic bishops, the Reformed Jewish movement, um, uh, a handful of other groups. And together we help write the International Religious Freedom Act, um, the first legislation dealing with human trafficking, that created an ambassador at large in human trafficking at the State Department, the Sudan Peace Act, um, and four of us, uh, I don't think Charles Colson and Bill Bennett and I, who probably never did anything together uh, during that time, we went in together to see um, uh, 
uh, key officials in the uh, Bush administration arguing for John Danforth to be appointed, brought an end to a civil war um, that had killed and displaced more people um, than Bosnia, Kosovo, and Rwanda combined um, uh, had done. And uh, it, the prison rape bill is a whole bunch of bills that we, uh, we uh, forged together. Uh, Sam Brownback and I became friends um, over the issues that we did agree. Paul Wellstone, as liberal as senator as you want, was part of that coalition. It's what allows things to be done across administration lines um, that has become all too rare today, I, I fear. And I think America is worse off because of the breakdown of bipartisanship, even amongst people who otherwise would be at odds with each other where they can find common ground. Um, and so uh, Sam and I did this. I had a lot of faith in him. He, first of all, he's a very nice guy, just on a personal basis. As much as policies he espoused were anathema to me on a whole range of issues, uh, both as governor of uh, Kansas, and I'm sure he felt the same about my um, uh, political views on, on many issues. We really worked together closely, so I knew it would be good. When he came in, he went out of his way for people who had, in light of people who had feared, I think, that um, he would only care about Christian persecution and not other forms. His first trip was to visit Rohingya Muslims. Um, he spoke out in a, one of his earliest speeches about Uyghur Muslims, topic I hope we can return to because of its urgency today. Um, uh, here, he had made it clear that he was going to continue what had been the past two administrations um, uh, uh, commitment to deal with uh, religious freedom and religious persecution as a universal concern of America and American uh, diplomats. And I think he did a good job. He built on what we had done to engage more countries um, by having this ministerial twice, um, uh, that brought three times actually, but twice in the United States that brought the minister level people together and really forged, built on a coalition we had already set in place to put together about 32 now like-minded countries who are working together on an ongoing basis on behalf of religious freedom countries from across the globe. Um, so I, and I'm confident that this will continue in the Biden administration. I know from my personal interaction with him for decades, how strongly um, uh, President Biden cares about the issue of human rights and international uh, religious freedom. I'm confident there will be as robust um, a presence uh, this time. The problem for us was there was a downgrading in a Trump administration of the rest of the human rights schema. And that led to the growth of authoritarian regimes across the globe, um, an undercutting of human rights across the uh, the globe. And I really am certain this administration will look forward to bringing back um, to a much higher place than it had been the entire schema of human rights and really emphasize the integration of all human rights together. You can't have some human rights when you give your stamp of approval for diminishing other core human rights. And that has to end. And I know this administration will do a good job on that. Yeah, very important. Yeah, obviously, there, there was a prioritization of, uh, of religious freedom and uh, and, and it's, it's good to see a more universal application of these principles. Um, during your term as ambassador, um, you wrestled with multiple threats to religious freedom abroad. Uh, you just raised Rohingya. That was also an issue uh, during your term. Um, what, what what were the, 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 the key um, trouble spots that you were dealing with. I know also, obviously, ISIS was was a huge issue uh, during that period uh, and remains, especially, I know, the Yazidis, uh, uh, the savage treatment of the Yazidis by, by, under ISIS. Um, what, what tools were you able to use to try to affect change in these areas? And, and are those tools still available to, to, to the Biden administration today? All right. So, uh, you know, just a fast overview in terms of the schema of religious freedom across the globe. Um, three quarters of the countries across the globe do not have serious problems with restrictions about religious freedom. That's the good news. The bad news 
is that amongst the quarter of the countries that do are China, India, Russia, Nigeria, Pakistan, some of the most populous countries um, in the globe, and about 80 percent of the uh, global population, according to the Pew studies, yearly studies on this, live in countries that have serious restrictions on uh, religious freedom. And they come from three primary sources. Um, one is non-state actors. That was new. This was really arising as I was serving as a tour it's the end of the Obama um, administration on these issues, ISIS, Boko Haram, um, Al-Shabaab, the devastation that they impose on uh, on the people who they have control over um, uh, here, the evisceration of minority religions, um, uh, the killing or um, ethnic cleansing of groups that they uh, differ with, um, uh, here, the repression of divergent views within Islam um, uh, that they... Uh, it, express. Um, these are really uh, 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 the growth of a serious threat. And it exists today in northern Nigeria with the, uh, the divisive persecution of uh, minority groups there, um, uh, uh, Christians there in the, with some of the Houthi um, uh, rebels and uh, rebels and now uh, control in, uh, in Yemen um, uh, here, Al-Shabaab and, and Somalia, the, in ISIS, wherever it's found in uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, these are all threats to any kind of religious uh, uh, freedom, um, equality, tolerance, pluralism um, uh, that is so essential to stability in these countries and the well-being of all their people. So that's one. The second is when you have governmental um, repression, when you think about China um, as a formal policy against uh, religion or the preference of one religion, think Saudi Arabia, um, with, with very little little tolerance of minority uh, expressions, even within their own religion, um, and almost none uh, allowed for uh, other groups. You can't worship at a church. There's no church. There's no synagogue um, uh, here in uh, Saudi Arabia. So you can't worship openly at all, and there's significant uh, persecution there. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that's another uh, form of oppression. The other are kind of the rules and regulations that really allow, particularly in authoritarian regimes um, uh, here, you know, any authoritarian regime is, is scared of people being able to organize their lives uh, around ideas and institutions that the government can't control. And so the government reaches out to try and control them um, uh, here. And then you have laws like blasphemy laws. 84 countries in the world have blasphemy laws um, uh, here. And think about what blasphemy is. Someone expressing their heartfelt belief that offends the majority who hold power in that country can actually, in 11 countries, be subject to a death penalty um, because of mob violence um, when accusations of blasphemy are, are made. And people know that the government um, punishes blasphemy and, and, uh, and disapproves of anything it considers blasphemous. People take the law into their own hands, thinking they have the imprimatur of uh, government. And this is a serious problem in a number of countries uh, across the globe. So these are real threats that uh, people live with um, all of all of the time um, uh, here. Having given that, I actually, you got to remind me what the punchline of your question was, because I'm not sure I got to the punchline of it. And I, but, I, but, but, I, but I, want, I want to pick up on some of the things that you were just saying, because you're, you're dealing with a range of countries with which, I mean, the United States has a range of kinds of relationships with some of the countries you've talked about. We have an important strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have a uh, important economic relationship and 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 uh, a complicated political relationship and strategic relationship with China. Um, you talk about you, you you didn't say it, but you, you were talking you were thinking about Pakistan when you were talking about blasphemy laws. I know, but but for instance, Iran, which uh, with, with its terrible oppression, the suppression of, of the Baha'i faith um, and and abuses there, um, you, you have you have to use different tools to deal with different kinds of countries that have. Either an adversarial or a, or an important constructive relationship with the United States. How do you how do you measure all that, and how do you apply these different tools? And uh, that and that was the uh, point of the question before. So I'm glad you got me back uh, focused on it against. Uh, but I wanted to just offer the backdrop of what we're sure. facing here. Um, so the um, the tools fall into a number of places. First, simply lifting up the facts the story 
of what religious life is like for um, uh, oppressed people across the uh, globe. So we have an annual report that comes out of the uh, State Department, in addition to which the Independent Watchdog Commission set up by the legislation that created the ambassadorship that I was honored um, uh, to serve in, um, uh, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, which I was also honored to be the first chair of um, uh, here, and your own Felice Gare, who mm -hmm. I regard as first amongst equals in the entire organized Jewish community um, in terms of religious freedom issues. Um, uh, here, she served as a uh, chair of it as well. Um, and they issue an annual report. But what these reports do, and the U.S. government one particularly, is lifts up the story of groups that are persecuted. And when you think about what the impact of that is, A, I was told over and over again when I would travel around the world, we never had anyone who cared about us before. We never knew anyone that we could go to when we were in trouble. Now we've got this political officer from the United States Embassy or consulate um, who's coming to us to say, what's going on? What is your situation? We're going to tell the world about it. What can we do to be helpful? And we'll often then we develop a relationship where they'll go and advocate on behalf of religious freedom when we face persecution and discrimination with the government of that, um, of that country or mobile other embassies to work with them on our behalf. We never had that before. So you have the political power that comes from facts that are known to people. And I would say over and over again, people say just the fact that you tell our story to the world, that it's not hidden uh, uh, from, uh, from the world is so sustaining, so, so um, uh, supportive of our own efforts to advocate on our, on our own behalf. So that's one, two. Secondly, there are a number of economic tools that we can use. Um, when a country engages in egregious systematic discrimination uh, in the area of religion, um, they are designated as a country of particular concern. And there, there's a range of steps the United States government can and sometimes does take of economic sanctions um, against the country. The, uh, uh, the Global Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act um, allows us to identify governors of a region that is overseeing persecution. Um, uh, think of Xinjiang province and the Uyghurs uh, today or the Tibetan Buddhist um, uh, uh, region um, in China, where we're able to identify a military leader, a, a governor, or someone directly engaged in the persecution and impose sanctions on them, sometimes on their families, um, uh, so they don't benefit um, uh, from this. And that actually really has an impact um, on that. And uh, so there are a range of diplomatic tools. And then we have the international coalitions that we can really sometimes all decide we're going to focus on an area that gives us that uh, multiplies the impact that such uh, tools have. Obviously, there are many other geopolitical concerns that the United States has with countries, and those come into play in terms of deciding what tools to uh, to use. But that gives you an idea of some of the range of uh, tools um, uh, that we have. And I would add one other thing about the report that I think is often overlooked. Um, when we began this process in the late 90s and the bill was passed, the International Religious Freedom Act, it was because religious freedom compared to other human rights was often overlooked. It didn't get the attention except when a group, let's say the Jewish community, mobilizing non-Jews to stand with us on behalf of Soviet Jewry, made a real cause um, about it in the civil society realm um, uh, here and then engaged, you know, the political structure behind us uh, to do that, the Helsinki Act and uh, uh, et cetera. So, but those were the exceptions uh, uh, here. Now, um, here, because in every embassy, there is an officer who has to draft the report and then has to be reviewed by the chief political um, uh, officer who learns about things that otherwise she or he wouldn't know about. And then it has to go up to the DCM or the ambassador. And then it goes back to the State Department where our office in Washington interacts with them to strengthen it. And then it goes to the country specific desk. And then it goes to the regional desk. And the CPC designations get it bumped up to the Secretary of State. All of a sudden, because of the report, Report. There, there are thousands of foreign uh, service officers today who know this issue, have engaged with the issue, know the human face of this kind of persecution, and that makes a profound difference as well. And it affects these societies. There are communities that have 
these close relationships with, uh, with, with, with our diplomats abroad, um, strengthening the relationship with our country. Um, I want to turn in a slightly different direction and talk about uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last six or seven or eight months, there have been really dramatic changes across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the Abraham Accords, um, which really build on frankly, relationships that were already forming kind of under the table between Israel and, and, and key Arab states, but also um, a, a new kind of a refocus um, and, and um, repu- uh, sort of a, a celebration of Jewish heritage in Arab states that, that had been kind of under the surface for, for a long time. Um, you've seen this process develop. You've been part of interfaith conferences uh, in that region. Um, in February of 2019, uh, a year and a half before the historic Abraham Accords agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, the UAE announced that it would build a complex in Abu Dhabi uh, to serve three faiths. There would be a church and a mosque and a synagogue, um, the so-called Abrahamic family house. How would you describe the significance of these developments in key parts of the Arab world? Well, they've been going on for a while um, uh, here. There, there have been pushback from more moderate voices in Islam uh, to get working together with often government figures who recognize the danger of the growth of extremism um, in Islam in terms of the freedoms of people in their countries that they led and the stability of their governments um, uh, that they uh, led, um, who began to work together to put forward more assertively and robust um, what they consider a more traditional view of a more open and tolerant um, Islam. Look, Jews, when they lived under Islamic rule um, for centuries, were second-class citizens. But in general, they lived with more freedom and more opportunity than they did in Christian countries in medieval Europe at the same uh, period of, of, uh, of time. Um, and that was true of the Christian minority uh, as well. Other minorities were in trouble, but uh, uh, yeah, those who believed in the one God um, live with clearly more uh, tolerance than those similar minorities than Muslim and Jewish minorities knew in much of Christian uh, Europe in medieval times. So um, uh, here, they those ideas began to be pushed more assertively. It culminated in the Marrakesh Declaration um, uh, here. I think, I, were, I think you were in Marrakesh. That, uh, I, I actually wasn't. I worked on that project for a long uh, uh, time and worked with the people <laughs> involved in it. I couldn't be there, but your own David Rosen. That's um, right. Uh, was there. And again, let me just acknowledge that the work uh, David Rosen on a global level is first yeah. among the world of uh, the interfaith uh, practitioners in the carrying on the Mark Tannenbaum uh, uh, role. And Noah Marins does an absolutely superb job out of the headquarters um, in New York and is a consummate pro. So you have a very strong staff on these interreligious issues. Mm-hmm. And David is fantastic. And he and I were together a couple of times in the UAE, um, uh, pushing some of these um, uh, developments that uh, that have happened there. Um, and it is the result of years of first courageous Muslim voices putting forward because there's not parity between extremists and more moderate voices. More moderate voices don't use violence to impose their views on extremists. Extremists do use uh, um, uh, violence to threaten anyone who offers a divergent view. So it takes real courage to be able to do that. But there were more and more voices doing it. It was nurtured by interfaith communities um, who had to be strategic about um, uh, when to kind of embrace publicly these developments. Of course, in the battle for the hearts and minds of people in the street, you don't want to be seen as the agent of kind of Western countries or, or uh, Christian or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist um, groups need to work with integrity within the Muslim um, uh, a community to win the hearts and minds of people. And a lot of that was happening and we were doing everything possible to push that along both the uh, the democratic countries of the world, um, these developments, but also the interfaith um, uh, community um, to push them along. But it had to be done in Muslim terms, on their own terms, um, in their own way. Um, and I have great admiration for the courage and the intellectual prowess of uh, those Muslim figures who have led this change. 
And thank you for recognizing the role that AJC has been playing in this for so many years. Uh, obviously, Rabbi David Rosen, our CEO, David Harris, of course, uh, led the conversation with the Muslim World League that led to the visit, the historic visit to Auschwitz uh, last January. And uh, it's a, AJC has a long uh, and, and very profound commitment to, uh, to Muslim Jewish understanding and building the foundation uh, David, for, for regional peace. Just a, a minute more about this, uh, Jason, because I hope everyone here, you know, the American Jewish Committee has a legitimate claim to being considered as the foreign ministry of the Jewish people at this period of history. No one does more to push the values and interests of Jews across the globe with governments across the globe. Your work with embassies here in Washington, D.C., your colleague Andy Baker and his extraordinary work on the international um, uh, scene and his role as the head of efforts on be, uh, to combat anti-Semitism for the Organization of Security and cooperation uh, in Europe, which is all the European countries and the stands in, in uh, near Asia um, uh, here. This is extraordinary work. Your Blaustein Center, um, the work that it has done intellectually on behalf of religious freedom and anti-Semitism, working with uh, um, Ahmad Shahid, the uh, UN Rapporteur on Religious Freedom in his remarkable report on anti-Semitism. I mean, this is an extraordinary moment in history and the American Jewish Committee plays an extraordinary role. And I really hope that the people who are your supporters um, uh, and your members have a very clear vision of what you mean to the Jewish people um, uh, right now. You know, I have often said publicly, I think, David, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, David Harris is simply the best Jewish professional that I've worked with um, uh, in my career. And it, it really is uh, uh, at a moment, a crossroads of history, you have arisen um, to play an absolutely vital role for the Jewish people, for America, and for the values that we cherish. Uh, David, uh, I think I should probably close the conversation right now, and thank you very much. But I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep going for another 20 minutes or so. But thank you for your for, for, for these kind comments. And, and, um, and your partnership over all these years uh, as we have worked uh, on, on these common issues. Um, you talked about, we, we've talked briefly about the fight against anti-Semitism. You mentioned Andy Baker's work on this. Actually, he and I together were in a UN um, Alliance of Civilizations conference with Dr. Shahid and, and with Miguel Moratinos and others talking about these very issues. But let's focus on that for a moment. Um, and the fight against anti-Semitism goes on um, as anti-Semitic incidents, including, of course, violent attacks, spike here and abroad, and hateful and dangerous conspiracy theories pollute social media. This is a fight in which you've long been identified, um, and AJC has been proud to be your colleague and partner throughout, uh, both in your religious action center position and, of course, uh, as ambassador for international religious freedom. How would you assess the commitment and effectiveness of European efforts to confront anti-Semitism and protect the continent's Jewish communities? And how would you rate our own government's effectiveness and our civil society's performance? What's your advice to the Biden administration on confronting anti-Semitism? That's about an hour's worth. So let's compress that to just a few minutes, if you could, David. Let's see if I can do the al regal achati on one foot version um, uh, of it. Um, this is clearly a different world today than Europe was, not just before World War II and the Holocaust, um, uh, yeah, but for centuries before. I mean, unlike the United States, there was a long entrenched tradition of state-sanctioned, academic-sanctioned, religious-sanctioned anti-Semitism in Europe that we have been generally free of um, in the United States, a country based on the propositions of the age of reason that changed Europe, but clearly um, had an, uh, an, an enormous impact in, uh, in America. Um, and today, the countries in Europe where we have seen this devastating rise of anti-Semitism, often in forms that we never dreamed we would see again after the Holocaust. Um, attacks on Jewish schools, attacks on Jewish synagogues, attacks on Jews wearing yarmulkes in the street, laws restricting now kashrut and, uh, you know, efforts to stop the use of kashrut slaughtering and circumcision. Um, uh, uh, here, there's a range of uh, different expressions coming from the left, the right, um, from different ethnic groups, um, uh, 
uh, here that uh, has created a perilous time. There is cooperation in almost every country in Europe between the Jewish community and the government that we couldn't have dreamed of um, through much of uh, European uh, history. Um, efforts to protect uh, uh, Jewish sites um, uh, here in houses of worship and schools and other institutions. Um, efforts to denounce uh, uh, anti-Semitism whenever it raises its head. Um, uh, and that is a really serious uh, problem. Um, obviously, uh, uh, in the aughts, uh, a lot of that the growth of anti-Israelism, of attacks on Zionism had to do with it. And the IRA definition that the American Jewish Committee was so important um, in raising up, played a key role in guiding countries how to think about when anti-Zionism, when anti-Semitism, excuse me, anti-Israeli policy morphs into anti-Semitism. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that was a significant contribution. Um, here in the United States, uh, uh, here, you know, we had for a long time been spared the more physical aspects of anti-Semitism. But in the last years, with great tragedy, we've seen some of the, the deadliest uh, acts of anti-Semitism in the entire history of uh, the United States. Um, and we've seen a growth of hate crimes in general. I mean, and, you know, think about what hate crimes are. They're an attack on the very pillars of our democracy. The entire purpose of it is to tear Americans apart, to divide Americans along religious, ethnic, racial, um, uh, national origin lines um, uh, here and increasing attacks on women and uh, LGBTQ people um, uh, here have been reported in recent years um, uh, here. And this is aimed at tearing apart the often frayed um, uh, the fabric of America, that strands of America that hold us together. Um, we're seeing a divisiveness unlike anything um, that we've seen in recent times. Um, so this is a perilous time. And I've been extraordinarily impressed with the response of civil society, as well as government officials. Uh, it's, you know, I can't think of an incident that happens like this, where People, uh, uh, political leaders don't speak out. Other religious uh, leaders don't speak out. You have an arson in a uh, church in Texas and our synagogue nearby gives the keys to the Muslim community um, for them to use. You have a desecration of a Jewish cemetery and Muslims um, come and help clean up um, uh, the desecration. Um, you see coalitions standing together uh, to denounce Islamophobia and anti-Semitism um, uh, across America. America. So this is an extraordinary moment, but there are a number of things, key things we can do. We can, our government can beef up um, uh, here, security, the cooperation in providing security um, for uh, any institutions that are being targeted for hate crimes. Um, our government can ensure that there is consistent reporting on anti-Semitism, something that the American Jewish Committee is and the ADL have pushed for for decades um, here. Um, we just don't have enough facts um, to really know where we are and enough digging down into um, the different forms of manifestation to know the most effective responses uh, that we can we can invest in really, and this is a problem with police violence and trying to do diversity training and racial sensitivity training, knowing what works and what doesn't work, really studying this in greater depth than we've done is really called for um, at this moment and have common standards on how to monitor and determine what's anti-Semitic, hence the push to say that people ought to use IRA um, as a way to monitor, to educate people, to train officials and the public um, on uh, what is in is an anti-Semitism uh, um, uh, here. Unfortunately, the IRA definition has become politicized. We can talk more about that if you want, so that the questions about it often have nothing to do with it actually says or what was intended uh, for it to be used. But, you know, when when uh, uh, the last administration was talking about, uh, uh, you know, anyone who supports BDS is inherently anti-Semitic, um, uh, uh, you know, human rights 
rights groups uh, that are critical of Israel, we're going to say they violate the IRA definition and we're going to punish them. I mean, it just politicizes this in ways that really is counterproductive um, uh, uh, for uh, having consistent standards accepted by everyone in America of what is um, and is not anti-Semitism. So the administration has real challenges but I know how committed they are to combating anti-Semitism globally um, and here in the United States. Very good, David. And, and, and uh, very much appreciate what you were saying about the working definition, which HSC had a great deal to do with uh, crafting and, uh, and are continuing to work with other countries to, uh, to, to adopt, and, and, and it's happening. Uh, and we discussed it a lot with the, uh, with the UN yesterday. Uh, David, I think at this point, uh, let's turn it over to... Uh, our audience to, uh, to to ask some questions. And Daniel Silver, I'll ask you to uh, pose the first one. Thank you, Jason. And our first question comes from Joshua Barnett, Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, as you alluded to, we have, we have lots of questions on this topic. Uh, where would you put the Chinese suppression and abuse of the Uyghurs in the context of the gravest threats to religious freedom today? And, and how is the United States confronting that? So, you know, I just, uh, I, I know the questions on Uyghurs. I just want to say a word about the Rohingya um, because they raise similar, uh, you know, kinds of, of issues and the disappointment in Myanmar and what's, uh, you know, what's happened, transpired both before the coup and after the coup. You're talking about the ethnic cleansing of a minimum of 750,000 people, if, if not more, in the most brutal circumstances, simply because of their ethnic Muslim identity. Um, uh, uh, that they had in that uh, in that country, and that happened before the coup um, uh, here. And you know, it was a great failure of the democratic efforts um, in uh, Myanmar that took place um, uh, here. And you know, the, for too long, the world was standing by on that. Uh, I remember my staff counted up, and when we were doing as I ended my tenure, and pointed out fifty-two speeches I had given on the Rohingya one them and about two thirds of the way through began talking about what Uyghur Muslims as well, because we were seeing even back then efforts to crack down, to stop the observance of Ramadan, um, to force men to cut off their beards, um, to restrict the educational opportunities um, uh, that uh, people have. And then beginning in 2017, it escalated enormously. Um, it affects primarily Uyghurs, but some other ethnic groups um, as well in that uh, in that region. We're seeing somewhat of a replay of the effort at a cultural genocide that we've witnessed in the, uh, of Tibetan Buddhists um, in Tibet, in the autonomous regions of Tibet um, uh, here. And we have to see it in the context of, uh, uh, of that. One of the great uh, human rights abuses of our of our lifetimes, and uh, uh, now we see a million uh, Uyghurs who have been gathered into camps for re-education, forced labor, much of it in the uh, linen cotton industry um, uh, uh, here, where we're seeing some of the boycotts that are going on of uh, of uh, uh, products from that region really having an impact uh, now, um, and. Uh, and the brutality of what's happening, uh, breaking up of families um, uh, here, in putting uh, officials living in homes of uh, people, outside officials coming in and living in homes of people to monitor what they're doing and all kinds of restrictions on religious freedom. This is an effort to eviscerate the, uh, the, uh, a people um, here either through cultural oppression or physical um, uh, destruction here. And so this truly is genocidal um, activity that we're uh, seeing there. I, I, we have to be careful about, you know, this kind of hierarchy. If something isn't declared genocide, it's not such a serious offense. The genocide Treaty has certain specific requirements of what constitutes genocide that don't make it worse or better than other brutality, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and uh, and brutal activity of governments and non-government, um, uh, non-state actors um, here. And we have to be careful about, you know, A, making anything that's terrible being called a genocide weakens the distinctiveness of a genocide in effort to destroy an entire people um, uh, here. But it also means that some of the most terrible things that happen because you don't call them a genocide and don't qualify that, um, people turn a blind eye to. 
But in this case, this really is a genocidal uh, effort here. Um, and uh, the international community really needs to work together on this. Uh, one of the best things the United States can do, because we can't do it alone, and we do have complex relations with China, but is to mobilize the outrage of the international community. I mean, think of the international outrage against uh, apartheid and how it uh, led to significant changes. Um, it wasn't any one country that did that. It was a world community and the pressure uh, together with those inside the country who were demanding their rights. And the international community in America has to lead that effort um, uh, needs to work on that, even while we continue on some level the my, uh, cooperation that we need for our strategic purposes, economic purposes, et cetera. And, and consistent with what you were saying before about the sort of the continuity of America's attention on international religious freedom from administration to administration uh, across party lines, uh, we saw the last uh, Secretary of State and the current Secretary of State identify what's happening to the Uyghurs as genocide. Exactly. Uh, Daniel, next question. Uh, thank you, Jason. Our next question comes from Rachel Murphy in Seattle. How does international religious freedom work differ from ongoing domestic debates over religious liberty? Uh, here, <clears throat> um, obviously, the idea of religious freedom is common, uh, whether we're talking international or domestic. Um, here, the right of people to live in a peaceful expression of their uh, religious life, to build their houses of worship, to educate their children. Um, here, all the elements that you are all familiar with that applies. It's one of the great things about America is uh, you know the robustness of American life and uh, of religious life in America. Um, here in America, because it was such a diverse religious country and a particular history of it, found that separation of church and state was in a particularly effective way of doing it. Um, here, there are critics from the right that say that separation of church and state is a made up um, a concept and it's anti religious and anti God, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's that wall that has kept government out of religion that has allowed religion to flourish um, and grow in America, unmatched anywhere in the world. More people in, than any other democracy, with the exception of India, that unfortunately is going in the wrong direction in terms of religious equality and religious pluralism, um, uh, but uh, only matched by India. More people who believe in God, more people who go to uh, um, uh, worship uh, regularly in their lives, more people who hold religious values um, central to their lives, according to every poll um, uh, here done of uh, global uh, communities in the most religiously diverse country in the history of, of, of the world. The uh, sociologists tell us that there are 2,000 um, religions, denominations, and different sects, many of them small groups um, uh, across America that America sees. And, uh, you know, it's probably true that uh, 1,900 of them are in California um, uh, here, but nonetheless, uh, this is the most religiously diverse. The last thing we need is a government picking up whose prayer is going to be heard and which group is going to be favored and not favored, which group's going to get government money, which group won't um, get government money. We've been spared a lot of the divisiveness um, uh, here, and we have more robust religion than every one of those democracies that is a government preferred, government sponsored, government established um, uh, religions. So this has been a remarkable uh, experiment in America. But today, we are seeing a conflict, tension between religious freedom claims and civil rights claims, women's rights claims, LGBTQ um, uh, rights claims. Um, uh, it, it, whenever two moral principles are in tension with each other, they're really difficult decisions that have to be made. And in terms of how you balance them out, we're going through this now in America. In the main, I think we need to robustly protect religious freedom so long as no one is discriminated against because of that. In other words, there is a compelling interest where the government has a compelling interest, limitedly applied, limitedly applied um, that can check any First Amendment right. 
any fundamental right. And I believe that the protection of the schema of our civil rights schema in America is such a compelling interest. But we have to uh, uh, protect those civil rights in a way that least restricts on the religious freedom. And so long as people get served, so long as people aren't discriminated against, then what can we do to accommodate the religious freedom? That's, to me, what the question is. But in terms of the comparison, this I will say, I pray for the day when the challenges of religious freedom will be how to balance out public safety against religious freedom, COVID-19, how to balance out civil rights claims that are in tension with the religious claims. I pray that that will be the plight of religious freedom across the globe. But we have billions of people who can't live out their lives freely. Um, uh, here we have victims of persecution, of massacres, of imprisonment, of torture, of ethnic cleansing, of genocide going on across the globe simply because people don't like the way they pray, don't like the way they worship God, don't like the way they don't worship God don't like the way they celebrate their religious life publicly and, uh, and openly. These are two in the main very different challenges that we have um, uh, here. And I do pray for the day when the challenges we have in America, as vexing as they are and as important as they are, um, are exactly the challenges that the entire human race has such, to do. Such a powerful statement, David. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, do we have time for maybe another question? Yeah, we have time for two more. I'll ask both of them here and you can conclude with the second one. Our first question comes from Richard Fulton on Zoom, who asks, have international Muslim leaders been more forthcoming in working with Israel and its supporters than many, but by no means all, American Muslim voices who are still wedded to de delegitimizing Zionists as fit partners? And if so, how do we remedy this? And then the final question from Martin Greenfield in Boston, how can private citizens support the work of the ambassador for international religious freedom. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, in terms of Israel, um, difficult question. Um, clearly, the Abrahamic Accords represent a major breakthrough, and this kind of outside-in uh, effort to uh, to uh, develop better relations between Israel and the surrounding countries is is. A pivotal. I mean, it's a, it's really a change in the history for us. It needs to be celebrated. And the Trump administration deserves a lot of credit um, uh, for that. And I say that as an outspoken critic of much of their domestic and foreign policy um, uh, here. Um, but it can't be either or in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian question. So long as that festers, um, there will never be stability in, in the region. That is it. And it makes everything else we want to do more complicated. It will result in greater pressure on some of those um, uh, Arab countries that have created or Muslim countries that have created ties with Israel um, uh, now. And if they become unstable because of pressures from extremist elements uh, uh, in their own country, not the same as the Israel-Palestinian question, but where they face extremists, if they don't work cooperatively to deal with these issues and to affirm the more um, uh, uh, traditional mainstream view of uh, Islam, um, it is going to uh, destabilize the region in the Israel-Palestinian conflict uh, can destabilize the region. Using those countries to help create incentives for all the parties um, to work on the, uh, the two-state solution um, uh, to, before it is too late, before it disappears entirely is vitally important and I hope this administration will build on the Abrahamic Accords, engage more help, engage more countries um, here, but also use that as a way um, uh, to help uh, bring us to a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict. Um, I don't know, though, Rich Fulton, who was such a key player in our religious freedom separation of church and state issues on behalf of the American Jewish Committee when he worked for the uh, committee for um, uh, several decades. Um, I, I don't know that there's that much difference at the grassroots civil society um, uh, level um, uh, here. 
uh, it, it, uh, there are people in the United in Muslim community in the United States who do work with Israel, um, and there are people in countries across the globe who do work in Israel, and there are ideological forces in all these communities um, uh, here to try and capitalize on the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict as a way to, to divide uh, Jews and Muslims in countries across the globe from cooperating across the globe. Um, uh, uh, et cetera. So, you know, these are uh, these are tough challenges, but we're living at a time where we're seeing opportunities that we hadn't been for. And the Muslim Jewish uh, Advisory Committee that the American Jewish Committee runs that puts leaders of our two communities is helping in this in this regard. Um, the Hartman Institute's efforts in this, Hichma, um, uh, uh, here are the uh, um, uh, is the International Jewish Muslim Alliance, um, mm-hmm. Uh, here, there are all kinds of efforts um, uh, that are making progress here. But obviously, a lot of this will become easier if the Palestinian issue is resolved and we end up with two states living side by side. And, you know, again, we all dream for the day. What can we do now to help make that work in terms of America's leadership? And what can we do in terms of our own civil society work um, uh, to help find common ground to work together to push that along? Um, so that's, uh, that's yeah, the question. The other one was, what can private parties do um, to help on religious freedom? What the American Jewish Committee has always done um, uh, here through civic organizations that you're part of, speak up for religious freedom uh, in terms of the tensions we have in America. Use your coalitional alliances with civil rights communities, women's rights communities, LGBTQ communities um, uh, to urge them to find a way um, uh, to uh, protect the civil rights of all, um, but to do it in a way that maximizes protection of religious um, uh, freedom. Um, You play a key role through the committee in terms of many of those um, alliances and the work that Jason and uh, David Harris and uh, Andy Baker do across the globe um, with countries across the globe can help push um, on behalf of religious freedom there. And uh, I know, uh, you know, when Felice is part of that team and the Blouse Institute um, that you do at the UN, that you do through the Alliance of Civilization, a UN uh, connected group that you do through the advocacy um, in your own right. You really make a difference uh, uh, there. And I have found, and I think Jason, I presume you have too, that more countries really are interested in combating anti-Semitism. More countries really are interested in thinking through what religious freedom means and how they can work for it on a global level than we've had before. So paradoxically, things are worse, but there's a mobilization out to respond to that, um, both on anti-Semitism and religious freedom. Um, that is very encouraging. And the American Jewish Committee uh, plays a key role in not just sustaining that, but in nurturing that on the international stage. So, David, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. I, um, I, I don't know what to say. You, you, you've really covered um, the... the, the, the some of the most important work of AJC, and, and, and frankly, this kind of a conversation um, with the depth that you brought to this conversation and the passion that you brought to it is also very much in the spirit of Mary Friedman. So thank you. Uh, I think this is a great way to close out this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your long-standing partnership with, with us. Um, and uh, now, Daniel, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Rabbi Saperstein. I'd also like to thank our global audience for joining us. And as Marcia mentioned at the end of her opening remarks, may Murray Friedman's memory be a blessing to his family and his community forever. Hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Thank you everyone again and have a great rest of your day. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. 
Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.